Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. I am standing with the new gear here. We have such great appreciation, all of our sponsors, David Knoll and our friends at Maryland Office and Tears, MOI. I, th- I thought it meant for moi. I thought it was French, but no, it's it's Baltimore. It's MOI. Uh, they've given me the levitating desk, so I'm standing now. I almost look like I'm on ESPN, don't I, uh, Dennis Colazzo's? What do you think, man? Even better. I think uh, ESPN could take some lessons from you and your setup. Uh, you look great. You're standing. Love the background. Love the bo- Baltimore positive. Once I get the green screen behind me, my hair will stop getting like white <laughs> in between, but it, it'll, it's going to be fine. I'm working. Good. Improvements where we are. And look, Thanks. man, I, I got to talk with you today because, I mean, Luke and I have been after this. The Phil Mickelson thing Uh, should inspire all of guys like our age, right? But there's been – it's been a rich sports week when you consider Orioles getting swept by the Nationals, Ravens getting ready for this journey we're about to go on, which is our favorite thing, which is why I got some purple behind me here uh, as Lamar is going to be tossing it around. But but the Phil thing sort of stopped everything, right? Like out of nowhere, 50 years old – I don't know. All things are possible, Dennis Colazzo. So you got to believe. You got to believe. Well, you know, the, the, the nice thing is, as you read about Phil Mickelson, is that his passion and love for the sport is still there. The guy, when he's at home, he's still grinding, uh, playing 36 holes. So he's still honing his craft. I thought he looked great. I thought he looked physically better than he has in years. He was tanned. He was lean. And I just love his interaction with the crowd. He just He's a crowd favorite. And at 50 years old, the oldest man to win a major – Man, what a phenomenal story. And I was able to get home in time to watch the, the final round. It was an epic final round. And, man, just a, just a great, great, great moment in the history of sports. Well, yeah. And I, I felt like it was pretty monumental in a way that look at this year. Tom Brady wins a Super Bowl of 43. Yeah. Right. You start to say, I mean, look at how good I look at 52. I'll be 53 <laughs> this year, you know, so there I'm starting go. to feel like, you know, maybe th- I'm doing the best work of my career, hey, but I'm not, not an athlete. Right. And I think it's a different gig when, you know, LeBron, I mean, look, Ovechkin got run out of the playoffs the other night. looks like, looks he like did. Santa Claus, right. He looks older than you and me both. Right. So, and certainly he's had more vodka than both of us. Um, yes. But I'd say for, what sport is and it being a young person's game and that would be said for young women in tennis until they see Serena right or um it's a young man's game at golf right all these young bucks coming out of this Texas and that Stanford and they're 23 and they can hit it 500 mm-hmm. uh, okay well you know here we are here stands Tiger last year after everything that's going on in his world personally professionally mm-hmm. physically all of that I, I'm inspired by this, and I think Mick's going to shake his ass this year. I think Springsteen's coming back. I, th- You know, all the old guys are coming back, Dennis. There's room for us, man. Well, we're all making a comeback, and you're right. It was great to watch Phil beat the men half his age and rub it in, and he had overcome adversity, Nestor. He lost two of his uh, favorite clubs uh, during the practice round, so he had a scramble. He didn't have his best tools heading into Sunday. So I thought that was also a, a big story that was a bit understated. And you know how it is when you have your equipment. No different than you are at your studio, but even more critical for him as he's battling. I hope it's better than me in my studio. I mean, seriously. <laughs> you know, he has a lot a lot at stake. The money, the crowd, uh, the pressure, the wind that was uh, just uh, you know, tormenting all the players. 25 mile an hour crosswind. So all those factors uh, that he had overcome. He had a 366 yard drive on his 16th hole, the longest drive of the tournament. So Lefty was able to muster up enough energy and really, really uh, make the biggest shots when it counted. But it, he's an inspiration to all of us. And such a likable guy, right? He was a, a runner up at many tournaments, right? And it's nice to see him win his sixth major at 50 years of age. And that's true. Now I don't think he's done yet. We got to keep rooting for him. I, I know you and I would never, ever admit that we were ever a runner up at anything. Right. Never, but never. Always but um, the graciousness that you know, especially in golf and that sport specifically where in tennis, you can throw your racket sometimes if you're John McEnroe. I don't even know where the rules are in baseball or basketball or I mean, in hockey, they all gather and shake hands. Right. Which we think one of the great traditions in sport that makes us like it. But when you've blown tournaments like Greg Norman style or Phil Mickelson style, and it becomes a little bit of not your identity, but you're 
you finish second, you, you know, a lot. And, and that happens anytime Peyton Manning finished, finished second to uh, Tom Brady a lot. Right. I mean, really, uh, you know, I went into this with Flacco last week about winning and how hard it is to win and how hard it is to win the second time. And the Aaron Rodgers and the Ben Roethlisberger, there's still plenty of guys trying to do that. Right. Cal Ripken, you know, spent his life trying to do it to, to actually do it. There's thinking about it, dreaming it, and then really doing it at 50. Right. Or at 43 as a quarterback, unheard of things. Our parents would, my dad would say, that's not possible. It's not possible to physically do that at 50 or physically do that at 43 to beat people half your age. Yeah, well, you know, if you still love the chase, right, and that's what gets us up in the morning, whether you're trying to win a Super Bowl or tournament or run a hyper successful radio station yeah. or or, uh, you know, a car dealership, right? It's what gets us up in the morning. It's, it's the chase. And I think the big thing here with Tom Brady, the big lesson for us, uh, Nestor, is Tom Brady and Phil Mickelson is if you keep yourself in tip-top physical shape, right, it affects everything you do. Look at yourself now. You're standing up uh, during your show, right? So you're taking yourself to the next level. Uh, I remember O.J. Simpson for some, some good things. O.J. Simpson always said that uh, he prided himself on being the best conditioned athlete on the field. And I think no matter what your discipline is, if you're the best conditioned athlete at your discipline, it gives you such an advantage, psychological, physical, physio physiological. You know, I think it all ties in regardless of age. So maybe Phil can't do what he used to do at half his age, but now there are things that he can do better, right? The mental game. And to your point, we were certainly all worried about him at the 17th and 18th hole with the crowds approaching him, him in Iraq. I was screaming at the TV set, Phil, focus, don't lose it now. I mean, you're, you're right there. You got to fish. I'm thinking, right, yeah, and land. he's got such a lead, and I'm like, but right. you know how this goes. One goes astray. There's water involved. There was all sorts of stuff. That, and I'm like, like hold. you're like, holy cow, you know, you got an but, island green but, there. But here's this. People are really pulling for him oh, yeah. in a way that you can't for the New York Rangers or the Baltimore Orioles or a team as a guy, as a generation. And I thought, who hates Phil Mickelson? You know what I mean? I, 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 I thought somebody, Tiger Woods. <laughs> but, but I thought, you, you know, who would be – rooting against him. And it felt like this weird afternoon after all we've been through pandemic wise, everybody's rooting for the guy, you know, to not mess up or not even go down that hole to even make it interesting, make it triumphant, not um, hanging on. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and golf is such a sport associated with the wine and cheese crowd. I'm not saying that disrespectfully, but to watch the fans, you know, maybe they were in a drunken stupor surround him. I mean, I felt you know, I was worried about his safety, but it, it was reminiscent of Jimmy Connors. Remember Jimmy Connors towards the end of his career when he had that night at the U.S. Open? I totally to the crowd, it. and I'm like, man, where has this thing been all along, right? And and sports like that need, you know, even baseball, right? They need that that Moment. interaction, yeah. From just get the fans engaged, right, versus sitting back and being passive and clapping once in a while, but just having that fan involvement. So I thought that was so special. But I did flash back to salty Jimmy Connors that softened up towards the end of his career and really became a crowd favorite, right? The villain had already become the crowd favorite, but in contrast, Phil was never a villain, right? Phil was the lovable goof who always, you know, blew the lead at the very end. Well, <clears throat> different kind of lovable goof than a John Daly or some other people like that. But, uh, I, you know, Phil Mickelson wins a major. Uh, we're yeah. off to a good vibe here. You know, my wife and I are talking about some OBX next week and some salt life down there. And you're out fishing. I got to tell you, this crab cake thing is taking on its own jam, right? Not not just because I finally, I set the equipment up in Catonsville. It was 100 degrees. I started to sweat. Jeff Moeller was trying to mess up my broadcast. All these things were going on. We wound up having like a perfect day in Catonsville. That's your side of town, right? We talked about business coming together, parking, outdoor music, selling bookie salads and making late night pizza and all these awesome stories about how communities come together. And we're doing stuff. These are the kinds of stories I want to tell. But I'm going to be a little selfish on this thing. You know this about me, Dennis. Now, I want to do things I've never done. And every weekend, you're going out right now, and you're the fish 
I think these fish aren't real. I mean, you're taking pictures. I think you're down Ocean City standing in a booth somewhere <laughs> holding the thing up with the gr- like right now. You're not really in Detroit. It just looks like you are. But I have video. Uh, I have real video though of me catching these fish. So it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I want to give a plug right now to a dear friend of mine. Now, I grew up. Um, I grew up. I got my new. Uh, I, I, David Knowles got this pad under my feet that keeps uh, my ankles good, so I don't have to see Doctor oh, so Steve. You're, you're bouncing now. Oh, you're it's, like it's my, it's, oh yeah, it. it's my yoga thing. So um, I grew up with a kid named Sam Tudor, and I know he listens to the show because he writes to me, right? So Sam's not a kid anymore; he's grown up like you and me. And uh, Sam grew up five blocks away. His little brothers, his dad, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, the whole deal on my brother's block, literally. And he's in my life through Facebook, right? So he hears that I want to go fishing. So it tells me he's been listening to you and me because I talk a little fishing with you. I think maybe I talked some fishing with somebody else last week, maybe on the show. So I said, I hear you want to do some fishing. And I'm like, okay, you know what? So he has his own little YouTube channel. And he okay. makes videos, right? And he ma- he catches fish. He just loves fishing, right? And he 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 he's got a little guy Fietti in him about cooking fish, but his offer to me was and, and, and see if I can pull it up on Facebook because if I can, I, I mean I'll share it out with you because okay. he sent me a picture of of what he wants me to do, and I swear to you, Dennis, I've talked fishing with you, right? We have talked about um, we talked about going fly fishing out in um and he uh yeah he did send me the picture let me pull this up here i'm gonna i'm gonna okay. show you this picture this is my pal my uh my lifer pal we grew up to, we went to elementary school together this is sam tudor here in the blue do, do you know what kind of fish that is you know what unfortunately i cannot see it on the screen for some oh, reason okay so. that's a snake fish oh right? snake so, head oh. snake head snake heads okay I've go ahead dying, i've been dying to catch one it's supposed to be the best tasting fish you will ever have and Everybody I've talked to swears by it. They're fun to catch and they're fun to eat. So okay. this so, is right up my alley here. Well, this is becoming educational for me, Dan, uh, right? So the part care. of the tour is where they came from. Yep. They're, they're almost like Loch Ness Monster. Right? They, they came, are. Nobody knows where they came from. They're eating all kinds of stuff. They're bad. For one point, they were like paying you to catch them, right? So were, yep, here's you, the deal. You had to kill them. They were paying you to kill them, not, not to even throw them back. Oh, right. You got to kill them if you Correct. catch them, eat them. Correct. So I've never eaten them, thought about them. They didn't exist here when I fished 30 years ago. My Aunt Claire used to take me out <laughs> up in Newark on the pond. So Sam hits me with this concept, okay? So listen, I'm not a fisherman, okay? I, and I know people, you are, and I've never urinated upon it thinking I'm not a fisherman. The last time I fished, and this is honest to God truth, I fished with Dan Rodericks at Pretty Boy, and it was before I was married. So we're going back into the 90s. We had a standing thing, me, him, and Mike Flanagan, to go fishing and never did, okay? So there, Lefty Cray used to invite me when I was a kid to fly fish, and I turned him down. I turned down a chance to, throw, to shoot free throws with Michael Jordan, a fisherman, yep. right? So, like, I've done a lot of stupid stuff. Bill Burton... The, the bridge in Cambridge, you and I have talked about this. I have fishing reports that I wrote in the newspaper, my byline on it, that mm-hmm. Bill Burton iced me all up to talk to Buddy Harrison down at Point Lookout. And like, I remember all this stuff, right? This is, I'm not on any notes, but I haven't fished in this century. The last time, well, I went deep sea fishing in Cairns in Australia in 1998. And I don't know if that was before or after I went fishing with Roderick's at Pretty Boy. Mm-hmm. I might have gone out to Pretty Boy. It was definitely before I was married. So it had to have been before 03. So it's been a long time. So what's happening now is my dear friend, Lachelle Scarlato, who's the executive director of the Ocean City Tourism People, right? Oh, very nice. She is having me be her guest that first week of August, the base out of Ocean City. And the, the Marlin Open begins that week. My dear friend, Brian Eater, who owns Ch- the Chaucer, where you're going to come have a crab cake. We're going to enjoy the view on the second floor east side in Highland. Town. They call it Upper Canton. It's Highland Town. All right. It's on Highland Avenue. Uh, what, what does it, if it's 21224, it's Highland Town. Okay, I don't care what you call it. That's Highland and know. Foster. It's three blocks off of Highland. It's three blocks from where Jaegers, Muser, and Hausner's was. Okay. But, but give me the zip code. I'll give you the. the You're three blocks from Hausner's. You're in friggin' Highland Town. That's where Highland you are. Town. That's, That's period. You are. Okay. Wear the hat. And wear it proudly, too. Uh, very proudly. So his boat finished in second last year. He got the big, you know, prize and all that stuff. So 
he wants to take me on his boat right that week. I've got Chris Field. I've got I'm bugging Jimmy Schwartz to get on a crab boat with me in Tillman and crab with me in the morning. So there's going to be mornings where I'm going to crab already. All right. Nice. Marlin open already. I'm bugging Rodericks. If anybody sees Rodericks, tell him I'm looking for him uh, to do this Savage River thing. I want to do the last week of August. Okay. I found out the Angels are in Baltimore that week, and I have a thing with Joe Madden with a crab cake, maybe. So there's things, there's all sorts of moving parts to this thing. But now this snakehead comes in. Yep. And I'm thinking to myself, I probably should build that in. I mean, right? I mean, like, if I'm doing a a true Bourdain, if Anthony Bourdain was here for a day, would he want to go try to find snakeheads and tell the story about what, a hole put him in the water here. You know what I mean? And and how crazy it is that they're here. I, dude, I think this is a I'm coming with stories. This crab cake thing's gonna yeah. be the greatest thing I've ever done, Dennis. Well, the snakehead story is fascinating and, and, and a couple of things. First of all, uh I'll already like Sam. Any any friend of yours is a friend of mine, and the fact he grew up in our area uh, you know makes him near and dear to my heart already. Second thing is I haven't made the time to go snakehead fishing, and I'm very fascinated by this. What is it? Is it is it different? What do you know about it? Well, it's you invasive. have to go to special places, right? Like Magathy it, River or like the river down there. No, right? they're they're everywhere nowadays. They're in the Potomac. They're in the Magathy. They're in the Sever. They're in the Chesapeake Bay tributaries. It's a very invasive species. It's in ponds. It's in reservoirs. Uh, in multiple. If you like catch them, they, they want you to eat them, right? They want you to get it out they of the water. They want you to eat them, but, and also you should want to eat them. Now, they haven't been as bad as advertised. Five, six years ago, ten years ago, uh, people were saying they're going to eat everything in the site. They're going to eat the bass and the perch, and that really hasn't happened, right? So the species has grown. It's become a favorite of the bass fishermen, but you could pretty much use the same bait, the same lures to catch a snakehead as you catch a bass. I know they're in that Blackwater Refuge that's south of us, uh, and and they taste really, really good. In fact, in Washington, D.C., restaurants serve them. They're on a the menu, and they are very much a delicacy nester. It's it's very, very, very good meat. Better than any codfish you've ever eaten. See, I, you know, this is great. This is yeah. awesome. See, this is like I told Don I was going to turn this into a social studies thing with oh, sports, man, great. right? Because we can talk about the Ravens, and we will, and whatever. But, like... I'm interested in this all of a sudden as I get older. Not that I'm going to love fishing or maybe it's going to be my thing. Look, I don't love the NBA, but I went with the kid that saved my wife's life and made sure that he went to six NBA games that mm-hmm, week because mm-hmm. it's his thing, right? And I went and I really realized, like, I'm glad I don't have a gig at ESPN having to watch this every night because I just don't love it. I don't love it like that. Like, I want to do it. I'm, you know, I mean, would I go to a game? Sure. You know, I mean, no problem. But, like, loving it and dabbling in it. And, I, you know me, I'm not a dabbler, right? I mean, like, I'm a, I'm a guy that likes oh, to master things, right? That's the Tony Robbins part of me. That sure. if I'm going to do it, I want to do it right. And there's reasons I don't attempt to do stuff because, like, I don't grab tools around her because my wife's better at it. And I'm like – you know, you do it, you're better at it as opposed to me being half-assed at it and doing it once every year or two years. I'd rather get professionals. But when it comes to like fishing and stuff, I see so many people doing it. I'm so much more interested in the act of being with someone like you for a couple of hours in that environment than hitting a golf ball. You know what I mean? Everybody said, well, you're 50, you played baseball, you played hockey. I mean, I did all those kinds. I played a lot of tennis when I was a kid and thought I'd be more tennis oriented at this point. Maybe I would be. My knees are okay. I'm relatively fit, but I feel like fishing might be something that if I do it six times in August, I'm going to learn whether I like it or not and whether I really want to go to Montana and fly fish, which I might. And it might become like some crazy passion for me. Like I might everybody says golf becomes you have become obsessed with it. You know, you're becoming obsessed with fishing, aren't you? And you had a golf thing for a while. You had, you had your, you've had things you become obsessed with, right? I did Dester, but you know, growing up in Essex, we didn't play much golf back in the day, right? The, <laughs> <laughs> demographically speaking, socioeconomically speaking, it was better. Look, I, I didn't even know what golf was. So, but I can take a pole to back river and drop a, a worm on a hook and, and catch catfish. You know, maybe catfish or a striper or a perch. So, uh, that's the, the great thing about, about fishing is anybody can do it. And as I've gotten older now, I enjoyed it a lot more. I don't even have to catch fish. I like being out on the water, uh, over the weekend, I saw some osprey, I saw some turtles, I saw some bald eagles. So it's just not about, uh, you know, being out there. Plus the company, the camaraderie, 
I happen to fish with Ken Penrod, who's a, a world famous bass fisherman. Here's a man who's fished with presidents, right? Uh, has five sons. I learned he's got seven granddaughters. They all fish with him. And you learn all kinds of great things about people and it bonds you and it's nothing like it. And you happen to catch a few fish along the way. And it's just the experience of being outdoors and not knocking golf because as you mentioned, I've played it for a long time. I made a lot of great friends in playing golf, but as I've gotten older, I, I, look, catching a fish to me is a lot easier on the body than chasing a ball and twisting her and, and chasing it in hundred degree weather, right? So it's all into what you are looking to do, but uh, fishing is a lifelong passion for me ever since I was a kid and I enjoy it now more than ever. I really do. Well, I, I, I want to go do some things I haven't done and the fly fishing, I think I told you when I was out in Montana, I saw people doing it and I'm like, uh, you know, one of my best friends in the you know world growing up, a real mentor to me. I, I think I've mentioned Mike Marlowe to you. Uh, Mike lived. Mike's back here now. I'm doing well. And Mike's a real fisherman. And I've never really I've only gone fishing with him once. It was in Montana and it was cold. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like ideal. You know where we fished? We fished with waders on in the river underneath the where the untouchables was filmed. Gotcha. Wow. Under this amazing. bridge. He took me there. Wow. And so we did that. I don't have pictures of it because you didn't carry a camera in 1995. And Montana, but, Montana is beautiful. It's it's a place I really want to visit. I, I love to visit the state of Montana. I've never been there. It's insane. And, and I'm thinking that would be the thing that would get me out into the woods more than like out like hike. My wife did hiking up in New Hampshire. She's got bug bites all over <laughs> from the – and I'm like, Nestor doesn't do bugs. So like if there's bugs out on the river you're on, we're going to have a problem then. So, you know, let me know. I mean, because I don't like bugs. And also, your your, your buddy Sam probably ice fished uh, someplace uh, on Dundee Creek back when we were kids, because that was the thing back then. You would ice fish for yellow perch. You would dig a hole in the ice and sit there and jig and catch yellow perch all day long. And you would take them home and eat them. That was uh, that was a lot of fun back then too. My my neighbor, Mr. Frank Bulk, uh, who was a policeman, uh, has long since left us. He was a prime mover in my education you know he went to Essex Community College and was very you know thought that I should go to college and uh, grew up across the street from me on Bank Street he was a big fisherman and a golfer but big fisherman and he always fished at Dundee Creek he always say I'll take oh, yeah. you down to Dundee Creek we're gonna fish and um so every time I see it on the map I'm like that's not Essex that's Dundee Creek you know that's <laughs> where the, that is by the power plant that the water was always warm you can fish it year round one of the best kept secrets in Maryland really 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 is that is Galatzos here. He's ever coots for you. He'll sell you a car or catch you a perch. I mean, either way, it's football. I, I want to get a little football in here, and and I want to. Um, Luke and I, I, I went after the Leonsis guys today. I went after the Caps, and you know, on their way out the door, and Barry Trotz, and the fact that they've lost me as a supporter when they lied to me about bringing the cup and didn't bring the cup, and then they fired Trotz, and here we are. I don't. I'm not holding my nose and laughing at them. But I am looking at the three years in you and I and the enthusiasm we had. We have pictures together there with the goofball from the Marlins, right? <laughs> uh, remember that? I do. The Mar I do. Marlin man, right? Remember Marlin him? man. Yep. Yeah, we took pictures with him. I, I would say this for, you know, where the caps are. Um, boy, it's been a rough three years. You know, after you win the cup, th that's, that's bad for the brand, what's going on there. It's, it hasn't been good. Well, T Ted has two franchises that haven't done well lately in the Caps and the Wizards, right? So Russell Westbrook has been a phenomenal story uh, for the Wiz. That's kind of kept them a bit relevant, all, his, all of his triple doubles. But aside from that, there's been nothing to talk about with the Wiz, and even less so with the, uh, with the Capitals. As you mentioned, the, the passion was there three years ago, and it has certainly waned since they uh, waved the, uh, the Stanley Cup above their, their shoulders on that night. Well, you know, I don't know what to say when you get ousted in the first round. It really kills any sort of momentum you'd have, especially when nobody really believed they were going to win the cup anyway. But once you're in the tournament, you have a vent. You know what I mean? Like they, they, you for, certainly feel like they have the stock to do that. They have players that could have caught on fire and didn't. And now they're out of the tournament again. And it sort of makes you appreciate how special 18 was really. Yeah. I mean, to, to, to do that. It's not easy to do. It's it's the hardest thing in sports to do to win a Stanley Cup. Well, I also think it's it's bad karma, bad business when when the you, you change the recipe, right? You you change the head coach, you change the dynamic, and maybe you didn't value him as much, or you, maybe you gave the assistant a head coach or some of the other coaches more credit than he should. But I do feel like a champion deserves the chance to to to. To defend that belt. And I'll go back to Trent Dilfer. And I knew I, you were going there. I got to go, I 
Got a flashback. Ryan Billick's ears are burning right it's now. It's a curse of Dilfer, and I get it. He took a shot to make the team better. But there's something in my DNA that says, you know what? When you get to be the king of the hill, you deserve the chance to defend that hill. Somebody should push you off of it. No one should just remove you after you've earned that title. And, and uh, it's in my DNA, and that's the worst thing in sports when a champion doesn't get a chance to defend that belt. He should leave it. Whether win or lose, he should be bloodied, you know. And like John Harbour says, the man in the arena, what it took to get there, he understands it, values it, appreciates it, and needs and deserves that chance for somebody else to push him off versus just have it ripped away from him. I'm going to give you a hard time. And, now. I, and, I, that was and I love Brian Billy. And I love Teddy, Brian That was Teddy Roosevelt. Not, uh, if, or or Harbour, Harbour copied it from Teddy, right? We all copy <laughs> stuff from everybody. And I'm sure Roosevelt got it from somebody else. <laughs> but probably from, from uh, Julius Caesar, since they're talking about arenas and dust and blood. But to me, again, just my point is, you know, to be the man, you got to beat the man, and you can't take have that. You got that from Ric Flair. I know. Right, 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 right. So that that's the curse of that. So they, they changed the recipe. The Capitals did, you know, going back to hockey, and and Barry Trotz deserve a chance to defend that that championship. But I know it was mutual. There was a, uh, there, there was some acrimony in that relationship between him and Leonzas. I get that. But look, we we work with people we're not crazy about with all the time. If, I'd rather have a coach I dislike but I respect than the coach I like but just can't get the job done, right? As, a, as an owner, as a, as a, as a person and who has that, that type of authority, right? It's but you'd never hire Bill Belichick because he cheats, right? I, I don't hire cheaters now. I want to I wanna win the right way. You, right. I, I'd, I'd rather lose the wrong way than win the right way. I'd rather lose the right way than win the wrong way. Because Nobody's banging cheated. on trash cans over there calling yeah, pitches no, a Coons no, for. No, no. 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 Tell the truth, be honest, do it honorable, take the high road and, and give it your best shot. That is Colossus is here. All right, all right, football, I, just uh, OTAs, minis. You you pay attention to this in a somewhat. You know, when I look at this, uh, our players are in shape. That that you know, do they show up? Are they in shape? You know, are they all in? I think that's those are the kind of clues as a fan, as an analyst that I look at as someone who's passionate about sports. Uh, Phil Mickelson showed up in phenomenal shape, right? You can see some definition. He's tanned. You know, he's all in. He's got the, he's going to give him, his, himself. He envisioned chance. winning that thing three he years did. ago he, and he said, did. I can he do this. Did. I will do this. No one will stop me. And boom, he went out and did it. And you would hope that some of these young players and, and older play, and veterans have that same attitude. They, they get themselves in the best shape of their life. They're lifting weights. They're watching what they're putting in their bodies. They're, they're just absorbing that game film. And that's what I want to see. I want to see these rookies come in in great shape, pass the eyeball test, because, you know, we've seen players in the past can't pass the physical. Uh, they looked uh, more rotund than they should and said to me, if this is your discipline, you should give yourself the best chance of, of succeeding. And coming into the league the right way, uh, you know, setting the tone, not having any hamstring injuries or thigh injuries or whatever, soft tissue injuries coming into camp. I think all those things speak volumes. And I really do like this, uh, this rookie class. It was nice to see them. Uh, they were showing them some things uh, from the past and they, they couldn't identify them like uh, VHS tapes and stuff like that. So, you know, you get to see their personalities on, on social media. And I think I wonder if Hollywood game. Brown knows that the other number five, like won a championship here. Wow. Man. What, a, what a story that is in and of itself, right? Hollywood Brown stepping up and taking Joe Flacco's number, which, you know, we haven't seen that happen with, uh, with uh, Ed Reed or Ray Lewis or Jonathan Ogden's number thus far. And we'll see how that goes. But uh, that, that's a big story. Uh, Joe Flacco, story. the most maligned character in the history of Baltimore. Like, literally, like, yeah. I'm going to be the guy who dies on the Joe Flacco hill because I saw the parade. I was there for I, I saw it. I saw it all happen. I'm not going to discount it. I, I, it is amazing to me how Joe gets treated that, like a bag of groceries, right? That's like, true. If, not if, even if, the wise market groceries, like one of those off brands, you know? Very, very true, Nestor. And if I can write one script for the NFL this, uh, this season, it would be this. The Philadelphia Eagles with Joe Flacco at quarterback. Do something. Versus the Baltimore Ravens in the Super Bowl. Oh, that would be the most delicious story for me. And I'm not wishing an injury on Jalen Hurts. or, But if, if, if something happens to Jalen or, or Flacco beats him out and something happens and they catch fire, that would be a, a the most the biggest story in Baltimore sports history. Flacco uh, against Lamar in the Super Bowl. That would be, in, if if I could have one wish, sports wish this year, that would be it. It's funny that like any person who considers themselves a Raven fan, that I would say to them, "Do you know why I like Joe Flacco?" And they wouldn't say, 
Yeah, because he won a Super Bowl. Same reason I love him. You know what I mean? Like, the, the, you know, like that that should be the answer, like, you know, universally. Um, but it's not. And that's OK. And he's in Philadelphia and boo on him. But uh, I did have a great time last week talking to Artica Cassini, who's a, a, a wonderful University of Delaware magazine editor who's writing a big story on Joe and Joe's participating in all. And she wanted some memories. So I've been telling some Joe stories and time will not dim the glory of his deeds. Dennis Colossus. What's going on? out of coons man we got uh, memorial day we got any cars in you're still paying too much for cars what's got what's happening man we're still paying way too much for cars but at least we have cars to sell uh, you know there's there are shortages uh, right now in almost every industry so they selling golf just, carts up in manheim what are they doing man they're selling whatever whatever moves but it, it, <laughs> I, i'm atvs are hot right now anything with wheels it's worth a lot more than what you paid for it years ago nestor it's just supply and demand it's insane but we have more than enough to take care of our volume of, of business and we'll we'll be stocked with well over 200 uh, new vehicles and 200 used vehicles the new ones are starting to trickle in now but they're they're coming uh, help us on the way but it's going to be a tremendous Memorial Day weekend uh, for business. And we always take care of our customers. We do a lot of repeat and referral business, but uh, there is a, a high demand and a short supply, just like the housing industry. It's not a, it's not a, a falsehood that's out there. It's reality. And it's a reality we have to, to deal with. And Nestor, there's also a shortage of crab meat right now, I'm being told by some of my friends and, and that, that own the local restaurants. So that is correct. Some have run out, which is just another a sign of the well, time. We, we right? don't have people picking crabs on the Eastern Shore the way right. we should. It's a seasonal business. They bring in people from Venezuela and from uh, that, that are professionals at doing this in the same way that uh, Shohei Otani is you know, here being a professional, what he does. So um, we're going to be learning about that, you know, along the way while we catch and eat snakehead and learn how good they taste. I haven't had a snakehead. Yet. There, there's no shortage of snakeheads. So although there might be a shortage of crab meat, snakeheads are plentiful, which is good news. So I got you, it. you ready, ready. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a <clears throat> snake in a cake. Snake Crab in the cake. cake. Oh, snake I like cake. that. You like that? All right. I love that. That's, that's, uh -huh. a, that's, a, that's a great catchphrase. Came up love with that it. on my own. There you love go. It. I, love I, it. I got a million. Uh, hey, uh, uh, we got tables for the 10 o'clock show hey, on Friday can, night. Can, you know? can they get the snake and cake special versus the filet mignon to surf and turf? We got snake I was going to say, I'm playing the record this weekend for stand-up. But, but by the way, I went to the record this week, and music's back. I, I saw my first live music thing. I went to a Rush tribute show the other nice. night. So big shout out to Paul Manning and, and Brian Recker out there. So, you know, Meriwether's on, online now. I'm getting Gene Parker on the show. We're talking music. We're talking sports. We're talking fishing. We're talking crab cakes. We both got shots. We're, nice. we're there. We're there. We're there. We're back, as they would say. We're back. Hashtag snake and cake. Snake and cake. There that'll it is. All right. national, that'll trend nationally at, at some point. In the, the hashtag the is, is, is crab cake tour, just so you know. And I happen to own crabcaketour.com and clubcrabcake.com, too. So you, you we'll better, talk about that on the side. You better own snake and cake, too. I, I like the way that sounds. Snake and cake. Ah. I like Delicacy, it. huh? All right. Make cake, baby. Yeah. Put some butter and garlic <laughs> on there, slather it up, salt and pepper, crack it up. Hey, it'll be beautiful. It's supposed to be delicious. The most delicious fish you've ever tasted. And I, I can't wait to taste mine. Anybody it's see really Sam good. Tudor, tell him I'm looking out for him. Tell him he's got his YouTube channel. I gave him an extra review the other day. All right. All right we are WNST.net. Dennis Colazzo's can be heard on Thursday afternoons and Sunday mornings and probably at various points this weekend as we change formats for the Dennis Colazzo show this week. Uh, you can find me anytime, anywhere at WNST AM 1570 and BaltimorePositive.com.